Greetings everybody around the world. It's time once again for Ancient Aliens Radio. This is the dedicated radio show for the cast of Ancient Aliens. Here we interview authors and researchers as an ongoing investigation into the ancient alien theory. Don't forget to like us on Facebook or subscribe to the YouTube channel Ancient Aliens Radio. This is your faithful host James and I'm going to be talking to Mr. Tim Swartz today. Uh, Tim has been on a couple of seasons of Ancient Aliens. He also runs uh, he also runs the conspiracyjournal.com website and uh, also has his own radio show on the PSN and Dark Matter Radio Network. That's the Outer Edge Radio. Uh, you got to tune in for that one too. Um, without further ado, let's bring on our today's guest. Hi, Tim. Welcome. Well, I thank you very much, James. It's uh, really a pleasure to be on your show. Oh, it's great to have you here. I know we've got some friends on affiliated networks and... That's how we kind of hooked up, but uh, you are an author as well, Tim. And uh, wow, you've 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 put some serious uh, time into conspiracy, um, space, time travel, Tesla, all sorts of weird and wonderful stuff, and uh, <laughs> even Admiral Byrd's uh, journey to um, uh, the North Pole, looking for hollow Earth as well. I definitely want to mention that book as well, Tim. Tim, I suppose, like all my guests on the show. Tell me who you are, tell me what you like to do, what what appeals to you, why do you research this genre of books? Oh, oh my gosh, uh, no, there's there's a, uh, we could spend the entire show just talking about uh, that aspect, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, you, you know, James, I mean, it's, uh, um, I'm really just, just, just a boring guy, you know, I mean, I just, uh, I don't do anything, I just, I just sit around drinking beer and watching television all day, you know. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, uh to, to answer your question um you know i have been interested in the the world of the weird and the strange for mm -hmm. for a long time you know I, i'm sure you've had guests who have come on and said that oh yeah i mean you know ever since i was just a little tiny kid you know i was you know seeing ghosts or flying saucers and interested in that stuff and mm -hmm. that wasn't necessarily the case with me um, you know, up until, oh, I don't know, mid-elementary school, I really had no knowledge of this kind of stuff, you know, and not much interest, you know, either. Uh, you know, I grew up in central Indiana, so, I mean, I was really into, you know, like, uh, uh race cars, you know, cause the, the Indianapolis 500 is, uh, is in Indy, in, in Indiana. And so, I mean, I was into that. I was into space travel. You know, mm -hmm. you know, I grew up in the 60s, so of course, you know, we had the Gemini and the Apollo space programs going on, and, and, you know, in those days, I mean, that was big news. I mean, the, whenever they would launch a, a rocket, I mean, that would, uh, that would be a live broadcast. Everything else would be interrupted, and they'd, you know, they would show these uh, these launches. But it wasn't until, gosh, I can't remember when it was, maybe third or fourth grade or something like that, mm -hmm. that uh, our class got an assignment uh, uh, where we had to, uh, we were given a, a current news topic and we had to make, you know, write a report on it and then give, uh, an oral report in front of the class. And it just so happened that I was given, uh, a, a news report about a UFO flap that was going on in the United States at that time. And after I, you know, I had no knowledge of UFOs, you know, I could have cared less. So, I mean, you know, I gave my report. Which was probably typical of, you know, like most kids of those days, you know, people are seeing flying saucers, uh, no one knows where they're coming from. And I, you know, that was about it. But from that time on, I was branded as the flying saucer guy. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I mean, here, for, from somebody who had no, no knowledge or interest in this kind of stuff, you know, then all of a sudden, you know, here I'm supposed to be, you know, the, the guy who, who talks to Martians and things like that. And, uh, uh, you know, it bugged me for a while, but, you know, as I got older, I noticed uh, one funny thing. You know, people that would go and, and make fun of you to your face, you know, when everybody else was around, would then come back to you later when it was just, you know, like the two of you and say, well, you know, I don't believe in that kind of thing, but my family and I saw a UFO, our house is haunted, what have you. And that's what really got me interested in the subject, is the fact that people were having actual experiences. Mm -hmm. and, and, and it wasn't so much the experience that interests me, it was, it was the reaction of people, um, 
from from having the experience, you know, um, because yeah, I mean, you can go and, and and report that you saw a UFO and report that you you know had a haunted house, but unless you have some kind of evidence, it's you know it's just a report. But it's it's the human reaction of of these kinds of experiences, especially for for people who have had no previous knowledge or interest in this kind of stuff. And that's what really kind of convinced me that that something is actually going on. That you know we don't have a firm grasp of our reality or or, or what is actually going on around us. True. It, you know, I mean, you know, century after century, people are reporting basically the same kind of stuff all the time, whether it be strange objects in the skies or haunted houses or, or, or cryptid creatures. And, and that's what is really fascinating to me, as well as the fact that, you know, a lot of these people who have these experiences, they're not interested in in getting any publicity or or anything like that it's it, it's just the opposite you know they they would prefer that nobody know about it except that a lot of people they they want to tell their story to somebody who will confirm to them that they're not crazy you know that 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 they're not the only ones who have had an experience like they've had. Mm -hmm. And, you know, uh, when, when people will tell me these stories, generally that will be it. I mean, they'll, you know, they'll, they'll thank me and then they'll go on with their life. Mm -hmm. And, uh, uh, you know, as, as opposed to some people who, um, they seem to want to thrive on the publicity from their experiences. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. the, the majority of people out there who have, you know, you know I mean, there's probably, we probably only know about, you know, like maybe 1% of the actual odd, weird things that happen to people out there. You know, the, 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 you know, the, the other 99% will, we'll never hear about because sure. because most people are loath to talk about it. Sure. You know, you've wrote several articles, Tim, uh, Fate, Strange, Atlantis Rising. I grew up on Atlantis Rising. Uh, I'm not too old a guy, but uh, UFO Universe, Floyd Saucer Review. You know, you've extensively traveled the Great Pyramid, Egypt, to the Great Wall of China. You've worked on several networks, PBS, ABC, NBC, CBS, CNN, ESPN, Thames TV, and the BBC. That's incredibly lucrative, Tim, in terms of uh, scope. Um, you know, I guess is it the genre that you're work is it working in? Is it is it just people are hungry for this stuff, Tim, because they want answers? It, it's incredibly difficult to research this stuff. I understand, but there's there's a thirst out there now, Tim. Ever, if, ever more than ever, I guess. Uh, there really is, you know, um, when. Uh, uh, I, I work for for a lot of years in uh, uh, television news, television production, uh, things like that. You know, the, and the majority of uh, uh, stuff that I worked with had nothing to do, you know, with the, with paranormal or or, or you know uh, UFOs or, or or what have you. Mm -hmm. And uh, but it seems like that the the the, the small percentage of uh, of things that I have done that ha that that involve. Uh, the world of the weird has has really received the majority of attention, and I and I think you're right. I mean, you know, I think that people really are um, hungry for knowledge on this kind of thing, and it you know that's nothing new. It it it, it comes in waves. You know, there was there in the 1970s uh, there was a a, a a a big renewal of interest in uh, ESP. And uh, other new age subjects, as it was called at that time, and then it kind of waned for a while, and and now I think, um, especially with uh, the, uh, the reality television and shows like uh, uh, Ghost Hunters and uh, and Ancient Aliens and, and and programs like that, that has uh, that has brought in a whole new generation of of people who uh, uh, you know. Had no idea that this kind of stuff existed, you know. I, you know unfortunately, uh, books and magazines, especially when it comes to uh, these kind of subjects, are are on the wane. Uh, they, there just doesn't seem to be the audience of of people who who want to buy this stuff and read it. But then, on the other hand, 
uh, there is an increase in popularity of, uh, of people who want to watch this stuff on, on television or YouTube or, you know, other types of, uh, visual media. So, uh, um, I think that has, uh, ha- has, has brought this renewal of, of interest, you know. Um, and you're seeing a whole new generation of people who want to become involved themselves in the uh, uh, you know uh, research and investigation field. Mm-hmm. Uh, unfortunately, a lot of these people who who come into it um, aren't familiar with the history uh, behind a lot of these subjects. So they'll come across something that they think is uh, uh, is brand new, and you know they'll write an article about it, or or maybe do like a little mini documentary and put it up on YouTube. And a lot of us who have been around for a while would be like, "Oh yeah, well, I mean, this is something that you know people were talking about in the 1950s." Mm. So <laughs> sure, sure. Uh, so I mean, you know, I ha- I have to stress to, uh, to to people who 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 are becoming interested in in this kind of uh, stuff is to you know do your homework, do your research, do research. you know, yeah, do your you know uh, look into the history um, of uh, uh, of what's going on because you know uh, everything everything old is new again. You know, <laughs> let's jump in off the deep end, Tim. Uh, you wrote a book, Admiral Byrd's Secret Journey Beyond the Pole, Hollow Earth Theory. You know, this stuff is wild, but there's such there's something to this you know i've had brooks agnew on the show great show it was too and talked about hollow earth and um his expedition he's doing there but respect to the hollow earth too it's not going away tim it's just not going away and there's like people are hungry to know what what on earth is going on perhaps just tell us about the hollow earth theory and get us into the book oh sure well uh you know gosh i mean it's for um I think probably since even before the beginning of recorded history, um, there have been stories that have been passed down. You know, at, at first it was probably, you know, from, uh, in, in, in front of, uh, in front of the campfire. Uh, uh, you know, grandfathers would tell their son, you know, their, their sons and then their, their sons would tell their sons and so on and so forth. Uh, the mythologies of a lot of times it starts out as like a, a, a creation mythology of uh, uh, of where people originate, you know, the the human race originated from, and uh, you know if uh, if if these stories don't involve the human race coming from the stars, generally they have them coming from uh, uh, below the ground, uh, and uh, as time has gone by. More and more uh, 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 scholarly uh, input uh, went into the development of the theory of the hollow earth. Uh, at one time, it was thought that possibly the earth was a series of like uh, um, um, spheres, one in, in one inside the other, almost like uh, one of those, uh, uh, like a, a Russian nesting doll. You know, where you, you, you take the top off and there's another mm-hmm. exact duplicate mm-hmm. inside and so on and so forth. You know, it, it was thought at one time that, you know, possibly the earth was like that. Somewhere, well, and then, you know, also you have like a, a lot of, uh, uh, like Hindu and uh, ancient Chinese mythologies that involved, uh, uh, uh cities, you know, like, uh, grand cities like, uh, uh, Agartha and, uh, Shangri-La that uh, uh held uh, say like an elder race you know maybe uh, uh the 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 original race of human beings you know before they came came to the surface and then uh eventually as it came down into more modern times we started hearing stories of say like polar openings where there would be like uh, um like a, a like a, a almost a, 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 a huge hole at the North and South Pole that would lead into the hollow earth. And, and you know, these, these old stories about the hollow earth had it where uh, the, the, our cru- the earth's crust was only like maybe, I think, around 800 miles thick. And there would actually would be uh, land masses and waters on the opposite side, you know, inside the earth with a, a, a small central sun, 
that perpetually lit the uh, the interior uh, uh, of the planet. In fact, you know, uh, Edgar Rice Burroughs, the guy who wrote uh, the Tarzan books, wrote a whole series of books. Uh, uh, it was the uh, Pellucidar mm-hmm. books mm-hmm. that ta- that that talked about you know, I mean, you know, a- adventures in, in in the hollow hollow Earth, and uh, you know, it's really amazing that even to this day with uh, uh what we think we know about the interior of the planet um there are still people who think that you know that 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 concept is true that that you know there are there are great openings at the north and south poles and that you know there's uh, uh you know the, the the earth not only the earth but other planets as well are uh, are hollow uh you know there was a there there was a gentleman by the name of uh, uh Dr. Frank Stranges who you know unfortunately he passed away a couple of years ago um, he wrote about uh, an extraterrestrial contact that he had with a, uh, a, a guy by the name of uh, Val Thor, who he claimed he met at the uh, Pentagon. And uh, Val said that uh, he was uh, a Venusian and that all the Venusians lived inside uh, the planet Venus. That, you know, the outside, naturally, you know, the outside was, mm-hmm. you know, hot and full of sulfuric acid and that the civilization actually existed, you know, in the hollow Earth. And uh, see, that's where the modern transition has has come about. I think that has kept the whole hollow Earth theory alive was the um, entanglement with the uh, modern UFO era. Uh, I think that uh, if UFOs never came about, probably the hollow Earth uh, theory would have uh, waned a long time ago. But thanks to people like uh, Ray Palmer and uh, Richard Shaver and uh, people like that, it's it's kind of kept the uh, the Hollow Earth theory uh, going. Sure, um, yeah, I think even uh, the Irish have a, a tale of that's similar to Hollow Earth, or at least the perpetual sun and stuff like that as well. Um, strange tales as well. Uh, would that be a, a high Brazil? Yeah, where the, the sun always shines. It's a land, a land be- beyond the seas. Um, and it kind of ties in perhaps with a, a perpetual sun inside the earth. Um, yeah. you know, well, you know, the, uh, uh, the, the Inuits of, uh, uh you know, like, uh, Alaska and, mm-hmm. and northern Canada, I mean, mm-hmm. they have tales that, uh, that they originated from a land very, you know, similar to that where it was a lot warmer. And uh, the sun shone um, all of the time, but it was uh, there. That land came even further north than where they lived, and you know, as far as we know, you know, there's nothing but uh, even more snow and ice. Uh, you know, the further north you get, so that has helped perpetuate, you know, the idea that there are openings at the, uh, uh, especially at the North Pole, mm-hmm. that uh, maybe our ancestors you know, were able to come from the interior of the Earth, you know, to to live on the surface. I mean, we do have a blackout on the north and the south pole, don't we? We don't have satellites going around there, and we don't have any visuals there. We only rely on, you know, what people tell us. You know, we're only relying on a very small group of people, um, military or navigation. How many people have gone to the Antarctica in in their history of the planet, really? Mm-hmm. Like? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, and I mean, I've seen, you know, there there are photographs that have been taken, you know, using satellites of the uh, the, the the northern and solar uh, southern polar regions that you know seem to show that it's it's all covered completely in ice. But I mean, you know, who knows? <laughs> you know, Photoshop is a wonderful thing. You know, you can <laughs> you can do a lot to uh, to disguise it. You know, whether or not. The stories of, uh, uh, you know, the, these, these, these giant polar openings are, are true or not. I don't know. You know, it's one of these things where, you know, like maybe Monday, Wednesday, and Fridays, I'll believe in it. And, you know, Tuesday, Thursdays, and sure. the weekends. <laughs> you know, I, I won't. I mean, I've, I've never been to the North or South Pole. So, I mean, I can't tell you one way or the other whether or not you know, it's 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 true or not. Um, so it's perhaps I'm sorry a good to say. perhaps a good time to bring in Admiral Byrd because this is where a lot of the research leads to. Mm-hmm. Well, you know, um, uh, uh, Admiral Byrd was probably one of the last great um, adventurer explorers 
um, uh, he 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 spent uh, much of his life exploring the uh, the Arctic regions, you know, uh, especially um, uh, Antarctica. And uh, uh, one of the things that really got his name involved in the whole hollow earth morass <laughs> was a, a a little booklet that came out oh my gosh I, I i it probably came out as early as the uh as maybe the 1960s it's it's really hard to say because uh, uh it's it's earliest versions were were xeroxed or or you know or photocopied and then, you know, given to somebody else who then, you know, uh, photocopied then that version and sent it on. Um, and it, it was called, it was like the, the, the secret diaries, uh, 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 of Admiral Byrd. And it purported to tell the story of Admiral Byrd's, um, airplane flight over the North Pole in 1947, early mm-hmm. 1947. And in this story, it tells how him and his navigator, uh, uh, at first they, they came across a region that was uh, free of ice and uh, looked almost tropical. And then they were, um, uh, uh, they were, they were caught up by, you know, traditional uh, flying saucers, you know, disc shaped uh, crafts. And they received a radio communication from these crafts, and they were told, you know, that uh, they had to follow these crafts. And they, uh, they, they, they went to uh, an, an an area that seemed to be outside of uh, their, you know, their their known maps that they had with them. And they were taken to a city where they met uh, uh, people who claimed that they were from the uh, the interior of the planet. And that, uh, they were interested in mankind's, uh, development of, uh, atomic weapons. Uh, the, and the story reads very much like the, uh, the early contactee stories, you know, mm-hmm. from, uh, from say like George Adamski or Howard Menger, you know, people like that, you know, where the, uh, extraterrestrials would, uh, w- would say that we had to give up our warlike ways and especially give up, uh, nuclear weapons. Uh, because of the way that they would affect uh, the rest of the solar system, galaxy, or what have you, and uh, uh, and then after you know, Admiral Byrd and his navigator were giving these, you know, uh, was given this speech, then they were they were let go, and uh, they were able to uh, uh, fly back uh, to their base. Well, what is interesting about this story is that uh and, and I and I talk about this extensively uh you know uh, in my book um is that at the time that supposedly Admiral Byrd was was doing all this at the North Pole he actually was on the opposite side of the planet in uh, Antarctica participating in a uh, a, a, st- a rather unusual military operation called uh, Operation High Jump and uh, Operation mm. High Jump was a uh, uh, supposedly it was a scientific exploration uh, uh, mission conducted by the uh, uh, United States military, but it involved really a vast armada of ships, uh, aircraft carrier, or submarines. I mean, it was almost like a uh, um, an invasion fleet. Rather than uh, a, a scientific ex- expedition, and uh, they uh, pu- publicly mm-hmm. it was announced that this was something to go and to uh, look for mineral resources in in Antarctica and and to test out equipment and things like that. And, and you have to realize that now this this all came about at the end of uh, right at the end of World War Two. When, uh, especially the Navy was, uh, decommissioning a lot of ships and, uh, they, you know, they were, they were paring down and, sure. uh, uh, what, what they had to them. I mean, you know, the money was being, uh, reallocated to, to other sources. And then all of a sudden they, they come up with this, this, this great grand mission and, and, and poured a lot of money into it and, and brought in all of the, you know, personnel and ships 
for this this really unusual expedition to Antarctica, and uh, wow. there really there really hasn't been a, uh, a a really good explanation over the years of why this happened. Some people have speculated that this was a training mission, um, uh, just in case the the Soviet Union decided that they were going to invade the United States by coming over. Uh, say, you know, like the, 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 the northern polar regions, you know, through you know, Alaska and Canada or things like that. Mm-hmm. Uh, but of course that, then that leads to the question, well, why didn't they just go there to, yeah, <laughs> you know, sure. to, to do, to do this practice it's a lot closer than Antarctica? Uh, I. It doesn't add up, doesn't it? It doesn't add no, up. No, it, it really doesn't. And, you know, the more research that I did into this subject, the, uh, it, it seemed more and more likely that they were, they went to Antarctica looking for something. And that something I think was a, um, a secret, uh, Nazi holdout from, uh, at the end of World War II. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, the last couple of years of World War II, uh, the, the, the Germans realized that, uh, that they basically were toast. That, that they were not going to win the war. And so there was a big push to take a lot of their technology, a lot of their, uh, resources, uh, personnel, money, uh, things like that, and move them to other locations, uh, throughout the planet. One of these locations was South America. The other was a secret base that they had been building for, for quite a while in Antarctica. Uh, 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 Nazi personnel, uh, intelligent officials and scientists who were left in South America later told uh, the Americans that um, the submarines that dropped them off uh, continued onward to Antarctica for they, they weren't really sure why. Uh, themselves, but uh, you know the rumor has it that is, is they had this this secret base there. So personally, you know, from the research that I have done, and from what other people have done too. I mean, you know, I'm not the only one who you know who, who you know who has uh, speculated along these lines. Is that Operation High Jump was a either a military mission to uh, seek out this this Nazi base and and either take it out. Uh, you know, or have an invasion or whatever, or it was a mission to approach them and say, "Look, the war is over. You know, you 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 know, let's 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 work together. You know, you don't you know you, you don't have to have this hold out here. You know, it's 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 really it's difficult to say because Operation High Jump was supposed to last about six months. Instead, it lasted about six weeks." And then unexpectedly, they, they, they pulled up their stakes and came back to the United States. Uh, Admiral Byrd went before, um, a, 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 you know, like a secret meeting in front of Congress, and it was reported that, that he told them that the United States and other countries of the world were vulnerable to invasion by enemy missiles, as he put it, coming over the polar regions. Wow. And he obviously was extremely um, shook up by his uh, by what happened, um, uh, and uh, and I think you know it may be just a coincidence, but um, you know not too long afterwards we saw then the emergence of what is now known as the modern UFO era. Mm-hmm. You know, just a few, few months later we had uh, Kenneth Arnold. Sighting a uh, strange uh, uh, chevron-shaped aircraft, uh, 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 in you know, uh, was it, uh, over the state of Washington, and uh, and then not too long after that, then we had a uh, some kind of uh, uh, mysterious craft crash at Roswell, around the you know Roswell, uh, New Mexico region, which you know it just so happened at that time that that was the uh, the only place in the United States. That had, uh, uh, you know, like the uh, uh, atomic air division. Mm-hmm. So, uh, you know, it's it could very well be that um, that Admiral Byrd did make contact mm-hmm. with mm-hmm. a, you know, with a Nazi base, and that then um, there was a retaliation in the form of um, 
highly top secret Nazi uh, technology in the form of uh, disc and chevrons that were starting to be seen all over the planets, and and then a, a, a possible crash of a terrestrial, though high technology aircraft at Roswell. For sure, for sure. You know, I I I also have seen the what looks like giant caverns on Google Earth. Um, that literally looks like big giant caves in, in Antarctica. Mm-hmm. Um, oh yes. Massive entrances into what looks to be a hollow earth lot. Um, well, you know, it's, uh, uh, you know, I don't think that it is, um, uh, 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 a coincidence that, you know, the Nazis were also extremely interested in, um, coming uh, into finding some of these lost underground cities and uh, and places. I mean, they conducted uh, uh, a number of expeditions, especially into um, Nepal and the Himalayan regions, mm-hmm. in in search of these uh, in these places. And I think Antarctica uh, was another location. I mean, I don't think it was a coincidence that uh, you know that they decided to to build. A, uh, a a secret base in Antarctica. I mean, the idea was it was is that they believed that there was a uh, a, a race of um, of humans that were. I mean, you know, they you know they referred to them as Aryans. You know, like the the perfect people, like they thought that they were, and that they wanted to come. The Nazis wanted to come into contact with them to to help them with their uh, you know thousand year plan. Um, I don't think. Well, you know, who knows? I mean, you know, I don't, I don't think that they, um, they accomplished their goal, but, um, you know, I think that, um, they did make, uh, a numerous, uh, searches in the Antarctic region, especially. It's like you said, I mean, you know, we now know through satellite photography that, uh, there are some very interesting, um, um, uh, openings, uh, in Antarctica. That, uh, you know, that could very well lead to, um, you know, uh, vast underground uh, locations. You know, um, I don't, my, personally, you know, my own opinion is that I don't think that the earth is, is hollow, like the, you know, like the traditional sense that, you know, people have been talking about over the years, you know, like where the crust is like, you know, 800 miles thick and, you know, the, the vast interior sun and all that. I think instead, that the, the the planet is crisscrossed with uh, uh, with huge underground caverns. Some mm-hmm. of them natural. Mm-hmm. Some of them have been uh, created by uh, uh, races that have lived on this planet, uh, 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 you know, millions of years ago. I mean, you know, I think that intelligent life on this planet has been around a lot longer than uh, you know modern science uh, says it has and i think that uh, uh, some of these ancient civilizations were very uh, uh very advanced technologically and that they 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 actually you know built a lot of these uh, underground locations that uh, uh, you know we're now just really uh rediscovering sure i think the whole Nazi and Nazis in Antarctica uh, theory, if you want to call it that, um, is the one thing that ties it all together. It ties Admiral Byrd's journey, it ties the Antarctica, um, you know, misdirection, whatever they were doing down there. It gives them reason to be there. You know, if the Nazis were there, the Americans were there. It, it's simple as that. It, it, they went where the Nazis were. They, they, they took them on. Um, you know, and if the Nazis were there, you know, they had this whole bizarre expeditions all around the world. They they would have went there. They were they were obsessive. They were besotted with finding answers to ancient uh, mythos, if you want to call it that. Um, but I think the whole Nazi uh, is thing is the key to understanding this whole hollow earth stroke uh, Antarctica problem. Um, uh, whether they come in touch with UFOs from an inner world, that's that's another thing, though, Tim. That's where it gets a little bit uh, more deeper. But I think perhaps, yeah, the, the Nazi thing is really, it gives us understanding, it gives us more believability, and it gives us more um, something to bite into, I think. Mm-hmm. Well, I mean, you know, we definitely know that uh, that Admiral Byrd and Operation High Jump, I mean, took place. I mean, you know, they, they were definitely down there. I mean, there was actually... Uh, a documentary 
uh, shot at the time, you know, by the uh, 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 military uh, 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 camera people that uh, that recorded uh, everything that was going on. Well, not everything that was going on, uh, but uh, and I, I can't remember. I can't remember exactly, you know, what the, what the title is. But you can you can find this documentary uh, on YouTube. And, uh, you know, it, 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 it shows a lot of, uh, the activity that was going on. But I think that, uh, it basically was a cover story and that not even the majority of the personnel who were involved in this expedition realized what the true purpose was. And, uh, and, 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 you know, none of the rest of us will either because, you know, like, uh, a lot, like a lot of other mysteries like this it, it it became so compartmentalized that uh, the truth will probably never be known i mean you know th- th- there are probably there were probably a number of people in the military it's much like the ufo you know story there's probably mm-hmm. a lot of people that at one time were in you know they, they were in the know of what was going on but as time has gone by you know these people have passed passed away the knowledge was not passed down, so there are probably uh, 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 files hidden away someplace that nobody is ever going to run across again. You know, it's 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 like the the ending of Raiders of the Lost Ark. You know, where they've got the Ark of the Covenant and they're they've got it nailed away in a box in uh, in this vast warehouse. And I think that a lot of the things that 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 we're that we're talking about is uh, the the knowledge has been sequestered away like that and nobody knows about it anymore those who were in the know have have died and and and, and other, you know it's it, it's just basically been forgotten you know maybe you know maybe a hundred years from now you know when people actually you know have the ability to go through this stuff if it still exists you know because a lot of times this material without even being looked at is taken out and destroyed you know, mm-hmm. uh, you know, maybe, maybe we'll know about it someday, but you know, there's sure. a very good possibility we won't. <laughs> For sure. Yeah, you know, and and I mentioned the the Nazis and UFOs there. Um, I think you know, with the success of the Ancient Alien series, um, I know you've been on a couple of seasons as well. You know, it looks like we've had UFOs or. Uh, aerial phenomenon in this planet for a very long time. Um, I know you've got a recent book out. You've contributed to the Ark of the Covenant and other secret weapons of the ancients. Uh, uh, tell us about your contribution to that, Tim. Yeah, well, this is a uh, 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 this is a great book that uh, mm. was uh, published by uh, Timothy Green Beckley with his uh, Interlight Global Communications uh, uh, Publishing. And, uh, you got people like, uh, Brad Steiger, Olaf Phillips, Sean Castile, as well mm-hmm. as myself, you know, contributing, mm-hmm. uh, chapters, uh, uh, to this book. And, uh, the, the, the chapter that I contributed had to do with, uh, um, the idea that, um, uh, uh, and, and, you know, I addressed this a little bit, uh, you know, earlier, that, uh, we're not the first technologically based civilization on this planet that uh, you know we're just one of many that have come and gone on planet earth um and uh, you know probably the last one before us you know uh, it, it it saw its uh, its heyday before the last ice age and probably disappeared you know this you know like uh, right around the same time and i looked at uh, uh the idea that uh, we can still see remnants of uh, 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 uh possibly uh, spaceports and uh, 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 uh and other technologically based areas on the planet you know and, and you have to realize i mean you know you have a lot of people who say that well if there was a uh, an ancient high technology civilization on this planet why don't we see remnants of them anymore and you know the 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 simplest explanation is is that you know most material that 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 we have available to us uh, uh metal concrete what have you it doesn't take a long time for mother nature to just obliterate it uh with the exception of uh stonework mm-hmm. everything mm-hmm. else that we come up with even plastic i don't care what they say 
you know, plastic has its day in the sun and will be gone after so many thousands of years. And we're talking about, you know, a technological, you know, a technological civilization that existed thousands and thousands of years ago. I mean, you know, some of the earlier ones may have been a couple of millions of years ago. So, uh, you know, there's, there's not going to be much left behind. Um, you know, after Mother Nature has its way <laughs> with with this stuff. You know, one of the places that I talked about is uh, a, a place in China uh, where they have found what appears to be remnants of uh, metal pipes that are crisscrossing uh, this mountain, and uh, uh, it's there, it's like a twin lake region. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, mm -hmm. And and from you know from from what can be uh, gleaned. You know, it, it, it appears like this stuff uh, was probably laid down 50,000 years ago, if not more. Wow. You know, it's, uh, yeah, yeah. And, you know, the, the, the scientific explanation is, is that, you know, that, that these aren't metal pipes, but actually the, um, uh, 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 like, petrified tree roots. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, that, uh, uh, because I guess that there is a process where, you know, after, you know, uh, rather than turning into stones that, you know, depending on the environment that, uh, you know, these, that these tree roots, you know, grow about, uh, that they're replaced actually with a, you know, almost like a, a, a an iron compound. But the, the odd thing about it is, is that, uh, um, as far as anybody can tell, for most of the history of this area in China, it, it's pretty desolate. I mean, there there hasn't been found, you know, any any other, you know, like uh, fossilized trees, <laughs> except in this one area. So, I mean, that that theory, you know, doesn't seem to hold very well. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, the, the the people who live in the area, they have mythologies that at one time that this was a place where uh, uh, people came and went. To the stars. Wow, like an ancient yeah. spaceport. Yes, yes, very much so, very much wow. so, and uh, and uh, uh, and that and, and you'll find that in a lot of places, you know, uh, across this planet, where you'll have mythologies, where you know, where, where, where people will point to areas of uh, uh, you know, like uh, mystery mounds or or or, or odd uh, shapes, you know, on the earth or stoneworks, and they'll say, you know, well, this is where our ancestors. Uh, or the ancestors of the human race uh, uh, came and went from the stars. You know? mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh, do you think um, perhaps Lebanon, Baalbek was an ancient spaceport as well? Or a lot of people try to theorize that that the, the spaceport was turned into a, a, a temple uh, by the Romans afterwards. Um, you know, it, it it could possibly you know it, it could very possibly be um, you know there's uh, the Middle East. There are a lot of extremely interesting locations there. Sure. That, uh, uh, and, and, you know, I mean, the, uh, once again, I mean, you know, the, the, the mythologies of the people who, who lived there at one time, you know, talked about how, uh, 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 uh beans would come from the stars, uh, especially to, to teach a young mankind, uh, the, 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 the arts of say like, uh, um, agriculture and metallurgy and, and things like that. You know, Baalbek's very interesting, you know, because of the, uh, the size of the stonework oh, yeah. there. I mean, as, as far as anybody knows, you know, I mean, at least with modern technology, I mean, you know, it's, uh, 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 uh we don't even have the technology to to really move the stones mm -hmm. that that are left there at the site. A thousand uh, tons, I, Tim. I think the biggest blocks are a thousand tons that we can measure. Maybe twelve hundred. We don't even know how big they are. Right, right. Well, I mean, the biggest ones. You know, I mean, uh, they. I, I I don't think that they were moved uh, from the the place that they were that they were chiseled out. Mm -hmm. Which which goes. I mean, there's. Uh, 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 there's mythology that says that you know after um, after construction is done, you then you then carve out one last rock, one last stone that is almost it would be like the mother stone that uh, was never meant to be moved. That it would just be left at that location, almost as like an appeasement, mm -hmm. you know, or dedication, you know, to to, to the gods. And, you know, which it could very well be, you know, that's, that was the situation with that one last, you know, giant stone. But, but, you know, the other ones, 
that actually were, you know, taken and used in their constructions, I mean, they're just, uh, it's, it's just unbelievable, the size of them. And of course, I mean, you know, that's, that's not the only location throughout the planet. I mean, you know, there's, there's other places too mm-hmm. that, you know, has this absolutely marvelous stonework that, uh, you know, I mean, uh, uh, Modern scientists say that, oh, well, yeah, you know, it took, you know, like a couple thousand people with ropes and stuff to pull them across the sand or what have you. But, um, uh, you know, <laughs> For sure. it, just bo- it just boggles the mind. It boggles the mind, that, exactly. Right? The more yeah. you think about it, the more the mind boggles. Uh, yeah. You know, I want to mention Tesla here because, uh, man, what a fast hour we're coming up towards uh, the end of the show. I'll get a few questions in, yeah. Um, you have the lost journals of Nikola Tesla, Tim. You know, I, I love Tesla. He's an idol to me. I'm an engineer, electrical and mechanical. And, uh, you know, he's like a researcher's dream in terms of engineering. However, outside his genius brain of engineering, there are so many facets to him. He's a researcher's dream, Tim, as you know. You wrote a book on him. <laughs> he is a researcher's dream. He's got everything in there. He has oh, everything no. in there. Um, pr- let's talk about maybe pertaining to uh, anti-gravity. Did he figure out the secrets of anti-gravity? And if so, has that been utilized for spacecraft? Well, um, I don't know if he actually figured it out. I mean, he did. I think he was the first one to actually um, to, to write about his experiments with uh, what we would now refer to as field propulsion. You know, uh, which, you know, other people have, you know, kind of, uh, uh, you know, use that, you know, uh, uh, flip flop it with anti gravity. But, um, you know, whether or not, um, you know, one of the things that, 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 that kind of irritates me with the detractors of Tesla is that there are a lot of people who kind of misrepresent Tesla by, by saying that, oh, you know, you know, people like you say that, uh, you know, Tesla discovered anti-gravity and, you know, built flying saucers and he was flying around in them and things like that. And it's like, no, no, no. You know, that's, you know, that's, that's just really, that's just really ridiculous. I mean, you know, Tesla did discover the, you know, the principles behind field propulsion and, and, and other things and did experiments. But, you know, face it. At the time that he was doing this research, I mean, the technology was not there for him to do much with it. You know, I mean, it's it's one of these situations where, like a lot of other uh, geniuses that have uh, uh, cropped up, uh, you know, uh, within the human race, is that they may come up with these ideas and do some of the earlier experiments, but the technology available to them at the time... uh, uh, doesn't make it possible for them to go much further with it. I mean, Leonardo da Vinci is another good example. Ahead I mean, of their time. These people are so ahead of their time. It's like... Very but, much but so. On the, and it's, on the, sorry, Tim, on the flip side of that, we wouldn't have our time <laughs> if it wasn't because of Nikola Tesla. He gave us the world we have today, really. Exactly, exactly. I mean, you know, uh, practically... Um, every aspect of our modern technology, uh, you know, especially in the, uh, the world of electricity, you know, comes from Tesla. I mean, you know, the guy was just so ahead of his time and, and he was able to, you know, what the technology that was available to him at the time. I mean, he took it as far as he possibly could go with it. Mm. I mean, you know, he he built the whole facility at Niagara Falls that that provided the first, uh, you know, uh, AC uh, generated a, a electrical system to the East Coast. Mm. And uh, I mean, you know, he he, he also conceived the whole uh, a, a wireless transmission of uh, of energy, and I mean, he knew what he was going to do with that. He knew that it was possible. You know, mm. he started to build that uh, the the wireless transmitter there on uh, Long Island, uh, New York, the Wardenclyffe Tower. Yeah, right, right. He called it. You know, he called it Wardenclyffe, and uh, he, you know, he would not have started the construction of that facility if he did not know exactly what he was going to do. I think the genius of his brain, he, he was able to visualize everything. He knew it worked in his brain before he built it. He, like you say, he knew when he was building it, he was just acting out the functioning result in his brain. Right. 
you know. Well, and, and that's the thing, you know. I mean, unfortunately, he didn't. He didn't take. He, you know, he didn't put down a lot of his uh, work onto notes. You know, uh, the majority of the stuff that we have today were actually written by his assistants. Mm-hmm. You know, because, like you said, Tesla had this, you know, unique ability to vision. He was able to visualize, you know, what he wanted to build, and then he would, you know, like then, you know, tell his assistants what he wanted. And, and a lot of times, you know, that translation between. Uh, uh, him trying to describe what he wanted to his assistants didn't quite uh, work out, you know, as as well. Uh, which you know, and because of that, I mean, we still don't know today just exactly how Tesla was going to accomplish, you know, his wireless transmission of uh, of electricity. I mean, there have been experiments, you know, even up to this day. I mean, crude experiments, you know, just using Tesla coils and you know, just like throwing out huge amounts of current into the atmosphere. But, you know, we know that that's not going to work, and that's not what Tesla uh, had in mind. Mm-hmm. You know? <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah. Of course, uh, a lot of conspiracy about what happened with Tesla's work. They say the FBI or whatever they were at the time, they they broke in, the former FBI, whatever their, their first name was, they broke in, robbed all his documents, uh, t- smashed and grabbed everything. Um, do you think we have missing files, the Tesla files, that has been used against humanity, against other nations, or um, implementing some of this stuff for the purpose of uh, war? Well, I mean, it, there's no doubt that the United States government, you know, swooped in at the time of Tesla's death and grabbed what they could get their hands onto. Um, and, and a lot of this material ended up uh, uh, setting... You know, in you know, uh, in warehouses for 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 quite a while. Uh, we do know for a fact that uh, 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 some of this stuff made it to uh, Wright Patterson Air Force Base, where and then to uh, you know the other uh, uh, secret scientific installations across the country doing various kinds of uh, research. Some of it actually ended up in the hands of the Soviet Union too. Mm-hmm. Uh, because, I mean, we, the United States took a satellite photograph of a, uh, an interesting, uh, uh, facility, uh, somewhere in the Soviet Union that seemed to show that they were, um, that they were building a particle beam weapon. And this was based on, uh, Tesla's idea of a death ray, which we now know, you know, is, uh, is a particle beam weapon. Mm-hmm. And the, the, the array that the United States discovered that the Soviets were building, uh, very similar to the ideas that Tesla had. So, you know, I mean, there's no doubt that the Soviet Union got a hold of some of this stuff. The United States, no doubt, was building the same kind of stuff. I mean, you know, you're not going to have the Soviet Union building something and the United States just com- completely oblivious to it so yeah i mean you know definitely um a lot of tesla's ideas have been used for military purposes but you know we here in the civilian world i mean we, you know, we're not going to hear too much about it naturally i think the only thing that we definitely know is the harp facility you know apart from that i think there may be other black op projects as a result of tesla's uh original work now more evolved research tim but i think um god knows where that research is at today we'll probably never know tim uh, oh sure oh yeah definitely definitely and you know i mean of course you know the uh the, the military will never admit just exactly what the harbor ray was uh, was being used for and you know and don't forget i mean you know the united states government was not the only one to build uh, a Harp. facility like harp i mm. mean we know we know that the soviet union and russia uh, uh, building the same kind of stuff, uh, probably as far back as the 1970s, and mm-hmm. uh, and more than likely, uh, China, you know, has been involved in this kind of uh, research as well. For sure, for sure. Um, uh, yeah, we're at the top of the hour, um, Tim. Uh, give us a moment just to before we go to mention your radio show as well. Tell us a little bit of the premise, what you do on the show, and who your co-host is. Right. Well, uh, uh, I, I'm a host along with uh, uh, William Michael Mott. Uh, with the uh, the Outer Edge Radio, and uh, you can find that uh, online at theouteredgeradio uh, dot com, and it's on the uh, PSN Radio Network, and uh, it's uh, it just a it, it it airs on Sunday nights at midnight, which technically would make it you know Monday morning, <laughs> sure enough, but we like to say you know Sunday night at midnight, and uh, it's just uh, it, it it's it's very similar you know to. 
uh, you know, what we've been talking about today. I mean, we have absolutely fantastic guests that talk mm-hmm. about, you know, the, the, the world of the, uh, the weird and the strange. But, you know, we also have, uh, uh other guests that, uh, you know, like, uh, we've had underground cartoonists and, uh, martial arts experts. So, wow. I mean, you know, it's, uh, it doesn't necessarily have to be, you know, paranormal based. You know, it's just, uh, what, uh, what interests us. <laughs> wow. Fascinating, Tim. Tim, we're at the top of the hour. It's been an absolute, quick hour and an absolute fascinating hour to talk to you today i really thank you for your work of course you've got so many books out there tim i just wanted to do a little round table for you today and throw out some uh, interesting ideas but uh of course people can find a lot of what you do the conspiracyjournal.com and tim swartz on amazon you'll find tim's books there tim i thank you for your time tonight well thank you very much james i had a great time tonight and i uh, i hope your audience enjoyed it as well <laughs>